Hi, it's Mr. Evans. Welcome to Room 310 Biology and our second video review for the biology exam. This will focus on goal 3.1, which is basically the chemistry of life. So we'll have a slide or two on water and its properties, the four macromolecules, carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, and nucleic acids, and we'll have a slide each on vitamins, minerals, and ATP. So let's get started. I love this picture of the properties of water. It's the only substance I know of that you can find as a, a gas, a solid, and a liquid all in the same location. And we owe that to the structure of the water molecule. We have two hydrogens bound to one oxygen. They're held by covalent bonds. And the oxygen is very electronegative. And all that means is it wants to be greedy about the shared electrons and pull them closer to it. Because of that, the oxygen end of the molecule is going to have a slight negative end, and the hydrogens will have a slight positive end. When molecules have oppositely charged ends like that, we say that they're polar. It has nothing to do with being cold or being in the Arctic, but the molecule is polar. And the polarity of water is what gives us gives it its unique chemical properties. So let's take a look at a few of those. Uh, the important ones to remember are that water has cohesion. Water molecules will stick to one another. Um, there's adhesion. Water molecules will stick to other polar substances. And a real key one here, water is a great solvent. It will dissolve almost anything. This is important in circulatory systems as water it dissolves many of the substances dissolved in your bloodstream. And your metabolism, chemical reactions take place dissolved in the watery environment of your cells. So water is a great solvent. Uh, water also has an unusual density. And the reason for that is the way water molecules will bond with one another. They form weak hydrogen bonds between the oppositely charged ends of the molecules. And when water gets very, very cold, it forms a crystalline structure. And it's actually less dense. It takes up more space as a solid. Uh, the reason that's important is if you had a body of water uh, we've got a lake or something, ice is going to form at the top and work its way down. If ice were actually more dense as a solid, it would freeze from the bottom and the whole lake would end up freezing solid and no life would be able to exist. So it's very important that water has these properties that allows life to exist on our planet. We need to mention acids and bases as well. Um, don't forget your pH scale. It runs from 0 to 14, and 7, of course, is neutral. Most living organisms prefer a pH between 6 and 8. I call that the zone of life. It allows them to maintain homeostasis. Um, down here at this acidic end, there can be problems for organisms. Uh, a, a human problem that we've created is acid precipitation, acid rain, uh, has a strong impact on things that live in the water, such as amphibians and fish. And many plants suffer from um, the effects of acid precipitation. Um, acids also have a strong impact on how well enzymes function. Enzymes are the proteins that speed up chemical reactions. Well, acids can actually change their shape or, or break them down altogether so they won't function. And that can, that can be a big trouble for a living organism. Let's go into our macromolecules, our carbohydrates. Uh, carbohydrates are made out of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And it's usually found in a 1 to 2 to 1 ratio. Uh, the most important carbohydrate I can mention are one of our monosaccharides, and that would happen to be glucose. Um, glucose is what cells use for energy. It's a product of photosynthesis, and the carbohydrates you eat are eventually broken down to glucose, which can go into your mitochondria. Um, glucose is C6, H12, O6, and carbohydrates are our main source of 
energy. And this is true pretty much for all living things. That we use carbohydrates for energy. Now you can put a couple of monosaccharides together and make yourself a disaccharide. Um, a good example might be sucrose or the table sugar people put on their cereal or in their coffee. Um, but if we string a whole lot of monosaccharides together, uh, we put a monosaccharide like glucose together over and over and over again in a repeated chain, uh, maybe hundreds or thousands long, over and over and over again, we might make starch. Uh, starch is made by plants, and the plants use it for long-term energy storage. Uh, it might go together slightly differently and form a polysaccharide called glycogen, which is made by animals. Uh, you and I store glycogen in our liver and in our muscles, but in both cases we are storing these polysaccharides for longer-term energy use. The other important one to know is cellulose. Uh, now, you and I can't digest cellulose. It passes through our body undigested as fiber. Uh, many herbivores have microorganisms living in their digestive system that allow them to break down cellulose. Um, cellulose is found in plant cell walls, and it is a strong structural polysaccharide allows trees to get to their great height, but allows any plant cell to maintain its, its rigid shape. Um, lipids, we need to mention fats here. And the, the fats that I'd like to mention, we have those saturated, which are animal fats. And we have the unsaturated, which are found in many, many types of plants. The unsaturated ones tend to be a little bit healthier. Um, but regardless of its source, fat is used for energy storage. A uh, very, very important energy molecule. It's actually got twice the energy of carbohydrates. Fats might have a bad name, but if you go to the Arctic or Antarctic, you'll see that animals use it for insulation. Fat's a great insulator. Um, it's also very good for swimming animals. It gives them a lot of buoyancy or being able to float in the water as this polar bear is doing. Um, animals are going to hibernate, are going to eat a lot before they do. They'll store the excess energy as fat, gives them the energy to hibernate. And finally, animals like this hummingbird that need to migrate. Hummingbird will fly from Maryland to South America. They will actually double their body weight with fat, and it gives them the energy to make that long migration. Um, phospholipids are another key type of lipid. They have a phosphate head and two fatty acid tails. They will arrange themselves to form membranes, and because of their interesting structure, it gives membranes the ability to control what enters and leaves a cell. So we'll see phospholipids in membranes. Proteins, a very, very diverse group of molecules. You're looking at hair, you're looking at protein. You're looking at fingernails, you're looking at protein. If we're looking at enzymes, the molecules that speed up chemical reactions, we're looking at proteins. If we're looking at antibodies, which are important in the functioning of our immune system, um, antibodies recognize foreign invaders and help uh, destroy them, so they help keep you, you healthy. They're a type of protein. And let's not neglect hemoglobin, which is a transport protein that we find in our um, circulatory system, makes up our red blood cells. So protein's very, very diverse group. And remember their monomer. Uh, the monomer of proteins are the 20 different amino acids, and all organisms use the same 20. We just arrange them differently. Um, so all of these different shapes might represent amino acids. The DNA stores the information needed to make a protein, and proteins are assembled on cell structures called ribosomes. And we'll cover protein synthesis in a, in a later video. Um, our two nucleic acids are going to be DNA, which is our information storage molecule. It's a double helix. 
and it serves pretty much as a blueprint for all living organisms. Um, RNA, you might notice, is just a single strand, uh, but regardless, both molecules have a monomer called a nucleotide. And a nucleotide is very simple. It's made out of a, a phosphate, a sugar, and a nitrogen base. I like to think of my hand to remind me of a nucleotide. My thumb is the phosphate, my palm is the sugar, and you have four different possible nitrogen bases. And I'm probably pretty sure you remember these. DNA, my four nitrogen bases are A, T, C, and G. And in my nucleic acids, I still have the A, the C, and the G, but the T is missing. Instead, I have uracil. I want to wrap up with a little bit on vitamins. Um, our vitamins that we need to know, um, organic substances we need for good health. Uh, A, we need for vision. Um, D, we need for bones. And K, we need for proper blood clotting. There are, of course, other um, vitamins out there, your B and um, vitamin E, but for whatever reason, these are the three you need to know for your HSA. Um, minerals, the key difference here is that minerals are inorganic, and the important minerals to know are calcium, which we need for bones, and iron, which we need to form our red blood cells properly. And we'll finish off with a very brief discussion of ATP. Adenosine triphosphate is the energy currency of cells. Um, cells are constantly making ATP, and ATP has the triphosphate, three negatively charged phosphate groups bonded together. They don't like being in such close proximity. It's kind of like a spring that's been compressed and wants to pop out. Um, when ATP releases energy, it forms ADP, which is only going to be two phosphates, and that releases a little bit of energy. So be aware that ATP is the energy currency molecule of the cell. So let's leave you with a little bit of a question here. Um, so here's a, a released HSA question, both DNA and RNA. So take a look at this and see if you can find the correct answer. Are DNA inorganic? That's a bad choice. They both contain carbon and hydrogen, so they are both organic substances. Uh, do they both contain a phosphate? Well, if I think back, I remember my nucleotides were made out of a phosphate a sugar, and a nitrogen-containing base. So I'm saying that that is my correct answer. I know C is incorrect because RNA is not a double helix, and I know that proteins are what contain amino acids and not DNA or RNA. So please remember to go to your teacher and ask lots of questions. This is not your only um, study tool. Please make use of the resources your teacher is giving you.